Thank you, Father, for the time that you have given us. May your grace and power be upon us as we go through this presentation. Lord, give us grace to understand in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings and blessings to your colleagues and friends all over the world. May the Lord truly bless you. And this is the Herald Report. My name is Kudzaich Gogora, your host. And today we are progressing from where we left yesterday. This is our fourth presentation in the series of seven or eight presentation according to the way how God will lead us. And today, brothers and sisters, we are looking at this subject. Has the SDA failed to deal with homosexuality? No power over apostasy. And this is part four of our presentation. To those who are following at the moment, you know there is a serious problem of uh, homosexuality in the church. And uh, we are trying to understand how we can deal with this subject. This subject is affecting us from all the way from the general conference to the local church. And we seem to be putting all our resources together. Let me say that maybe we're putting all our resources together to see the most ideal way of dealing with this subject. Because uh, we believe, uh, or they believe rather, that it's complex. They believe it's difficult. They believe it's sensitive. That's what they say, brothers and sisters. So remember, right now we have got members of the LGBT who are some of them are pastors in the church. We have got conferences and union who are pro-LGBT, like the Potomac Conference uh, in the United States of America, like the Hans Conference in Germany and the Northern German Con Union as well. They are all pro-LGBT LGBT, and they are happy to work with them. Not only that, we can hear the echoes all over the world of people who are supportive of the LGBT. Uh, there is an article in the paper, Adventist Today, and this article is written by the gentleman, I don't know whether should I say gentleman, possibly is a gentleman from Botswana there, Admiral Ngube. The gentleman has written his article, he says, should Adventists defend liberty of conscience over ev of everyone, even LGBT Christians? So he's actually asking a question, and when you read this article, he seemed to be pro-LGBT. He seemed to be a voice for the LGBT. He seemed to be concerned that we need to do something to help the LGBT community. If we believe in the liberty of conscience, then we should allow also the LGBT to practice and also we should seek to protect them uh, from those who are attacking them brothers and sisters I want to say that you know as I was reading this article it's a very painful article you can read it to yourself and then you make it what the author is trying to say but let's just focus on a few things which is saying because the fact that it has been ad it has been written in the Adventist today they want us to read it and also they will allow us to critique it as we go through the Word of God and looking at what this gentleman many say but as I say brothers and sisters oh this is one of those articles now look at it it says let us use an example of the as an example, the treatment of the LGB community Christians have long tried to paint themselves as persecuted minority now the question is is this gentleman a Christian or not he is writing outside the box he seem not to want to be associated with his thinking but brother and sister this gentleman I think is one of them is the liberal view of Adventists now look at the red word it says through all this we've ad we Adventists have not just watched but at the highest level of the church have supported efforts to legislate our interpretation of the Bible. In other words, he doesn't seem to agree with our interpretation of the Bible. He's saying, we do this. Now the question is, what are we doing something bad? When we are saying the Bible says this, inspiration says this, is it evil? And then he goes on to say that uh, the persecution which we claim governments will do to us, we Adventists, while claiming to support liberty of conscience, are either advocating for or remaining silent about. You know, brothers and sisters, that's why I say, you know, it's very painful to read this article. I don't know what this author is trying to achieve, but, oh, Lord, have mercy. Now look at the next, uh, next uh, paragraph. He says, the question here is not whether homosexuality is a sin. The question is whether Adventists who profess to be champions of liberty of conscience should be indifferent to or in some cases 
celebrate in human treatment and criminalization of the LGBT community. What exactly are you saying, my brother? My brother here is seem to suggesting that, you know, we need to speak against governments like that of Uganda. We need to speak against the governments of Saudi Arabia where homosexuality is a crime. The man does not want to suggest, he doesn't want to come clear whether he believes homosexuality is sin or not. He decides that, you know, he will just pause that statement and leave that. By the way, uh, it is, this article is signed that this gentleman is a PhD. I don't know what that, uh, well, it means something. But now, he's saying as a church we need to create a safe haven for LGBT. He suggests that we need to advocate for LGBT. We, sh uh, we should do something to ensure that this community is safe. This community is free to practice their LGBT because that's what they feel is the liberty of conscience. The fact is that as an organization, brothers and sisters, we are not working the same way. There are those who think one way. Remember the words of this gentleman, he said there is liberality and conservatism. And we see this liberality and conservatism in dealing with this subject. But remember, the theme is content for the faith, which was once delivered to the saints because there are some men who are scribed in our, our way. And these men have been ordained to destroy the work of God. Therefore, the call of God is that we may contend for the faith. But let's go to the next paragraph. It says, should not our advocates of liberty of conscience lead us to fight discrimination, even for those who don't subscribe to our values? We preach that in the future the apostate churches will use the power of the state to advance their agenda. But are we not guilty of the same when we allow governments to legislate discrimination towards sexual minorities? In other words, he say we should uh, lobby like everyone else. We should uh, influence governments like everyone else. We should work with the government. In fact, when you read the whole article, you realize that he's actually talking about uh, we working to influence the governments to take a certain direction. Basically, he's advocating more or less like for a political movement to ensure that we lobby for liberty of conscience. But now listen, that's his thinking. And uh, I did not check what others say about this article, but I'm sure I'll see quite a lot of comments. But now, I want to focus on what has happened uh, on sa last Sabbath, because the General Conference decided to respond to what is happening in the world. They made a statement. In fact, it was a presentation, more or less like a sermon. And also there was question and answers on how we deal with this problem. I will safely say to you, I've listened to the message and I was very much happy to listen to that powerful message. I was encouraged. I realized that, you know, this is the position of the Seventh-day Adventists and I agree fully. But there's something which is very interesting. People react to this message differently. And if you have not listened to the message, I will encourage you to listen to this message by Elder McFinley, Love, Compassion and Truth a biblical view of homosexuality. It's very, very good message. It's actually very powerful, well presented. Facts are well coordinating. In fact, facts are well presented. You will definitely enjoy the message. So therefore, the first comment which I want to read, he says, uh, this was written by someone, he says, Pastor McFinley, well done. This message is balanced, honest, biblical, and loving present presented to all people. Every Christian and non-Christian uh, should listen to this message with an open heart and mind and there will be a great room for conviction by the truth. God bless you as you continue to speak the truth in love. I agree with the commentator. May the Lord bless the general conference. They are doing their best. Indeed, there is evidence that they have compelled this, they, 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 they have compelled, they have organized this message they have compiled to ensure that at least we have an understanding of the truth, which is the position. However, there are quite an other people who are looking at something differently. The question is, as we have addressed this problem, as we have made this statement, 
has it addressed the real problem? Now look at this comment. It says, I appreciate this sermon. It was much needed. I'm perplexed it as well to how the Potomac group here in the U.S. is allowed to accept and advocate for the alternative lifestyle, stating that the church as well as the conference has alternative lifestyle persons in them and states that we must love. Love, no doubt, yet we are not allowed to save in any capacity of the church if we have known sins. Now, this is powerful. The author here, He's bringing out something very interesting. If I'm an adulterer, I'm not allowed to save in the church. But if I'm a homosexual, like Pastor Gunjevic, I still have my position until today. What exactly does that mean? Where is the balance in the application of the word of God? Have we failed to address this problem? Why can we allow the conference, like Potomac Pato Conference and the Northern Gen the Hans Conference in Germany to continue promoting LGBT? This is the questions which many are asking. But now let's look at the next, uh, um, the next uh, comment. It says, is the SDA church finally taking a stance on this issue? I question if the SDA church is going to take an official stance. Why is indeed doing something about the absolute heresy being taught to our young people in schools like, Lo, like La Sierra, Loma Linda, Andrews? It seems like the leadership continues to kick the can. I have seen no action taken and leaders at these, those schools have been actively encouraging affirmation of homosexuality and LGBT. Oh, that's serious. This is happening in our schools. We have heard the statement from the General Conference. I sincerely agree with the statement. But the question is how will that statement become an action? How are we going to deal with the situation on the ground? Please, I'm actually coming to that very soon. But now, look at the other co comment. It says, the moment SDA introduced women as pastors, we have lost the battle. The same arguments used to justify women ordination will be the same ones used to justify LGBTQ acceptance in the church. You sh yeah, and then it mentioned uh, Randy Roberts, you should know better. As we said in our previous presentation last Friday, if we advocate for women ordination, we would definitely advocate for LGBT. The moment we take a stance as a conference or as a union to accept women ordination, the LGBT uses the same argument. Therefore, we are going to accept. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are called not to compromise an inch because the moment you compromise the word of God, you have no limitation in what you can do. But now look at the other comment. Mr. Finley, all the example you shared as you, as you why you have decided to speak are issues happening in the world that's outside the church these things are happening inside the church and not once did you speak on them oh yes very interesting is it i observe the uh, the discussion the discussion builds on what is happening outside it builds on the arguments posed by the lgbt they are they are uh, their chants and so forth they are chanting but it doesn't mention anything about what is happening in the Potomac Conference. It doesn't mention anything what is happening in the German Conference. It doesn't mention anything about La Sierra University. It doesn't mention anything about Andrews University. The question is, if we are going to address this problem, are we going to address it from outside, from in, inside? Because the issue is that we have a problem within. Because we've got a problem within, how are we addressing the problem within? These are arguments which are being posed, brothers and sisters. But make no mistake, the presentation is very wonderful. But now look at what it says. These things are happening inside the church and not once did you speak on them. Also, you can... How can you share a statement saying it's the stand of the church when the sentiments are not shared by the local churches, schools, and hospitals? Several Seventh-day Adventist institutions have affirmed the LGBTQ lifestyle and themselves are part of the group as well. Oh yes, 
So this is an argument, brothers and sisters. How are we going to deal with this? As a general conference has a position, but the position is not being shared by the church. We seem to be having a different, because if you look at what is happening in the Potomac or in the Hans conference, there is a different stance. There is a different understanding. Now the question is, how do you deal with these problems? We are going to come to that shortly, but look at the end of uh, the, this uh, statement. It says, what is the GC stance on the issue? The GC is the head organization and as such should ensure that divisions, union, churches are on the same page. Oh, this poses a serious question now. Are we on the same page with the general conference? If we are on the same page with the general conference, how come the general conference says we cannot do ordination, but these conferences are ordaining? How come the general conference says we cannot affirm LGBT and these conferences are affirming the LGBT? Uh, where is the correlation? Because they seem to be a different. What exactly does it mean to we, the members of the church? And how are we going to deal with this as members of the church? Now the question is, I must ask a question. Can two walk together unless they agree? How will the general conference and the local conference work together in this kind of situation? But nothing is further from the truth. Let's just go through the discussion. And says, how can the board be strong? If the head is weak, I'm disappointed that the leadership of the church has mortgaged God's church to please the world. A well-written political correct statement from the GC will not cut it. Ooh -hoh. So as others, I say, this, this person is very interesting. This is a well-written political statement. So if it's a well-written political statement, is it really addressing the problem? It's a political statement, so this person say. But anyway, but my brothers and sisters, I think it would be very nice to listen to what the GC have said regarding. I've listened to question and answer, all of it, more than once. I've listened to some parts I've listened to it several times. But now listen to this part. So please, take a look and let me know what you think, because I'm going to read some comments regarding what others think. So just take a look. You know, somebody asked the question, and to follow up what it, on what Elder Wilson said, somebody asked the question, um, will the general conference fire people, uh, pastors, who have a different viewpoint and who believe that LGBTQ plus relationships are not in harmony with the Bible? Uh, the general conference does not hire or fire pastors. Pastors are hired through a local conference, and so the and, and those local conferences have constituent bases where the, what the general conference can do is influence. We can share what the, we believe the biblical values are and in loving compassion, we can encourage administrators. But really the issue of local pastors is in the hands of a local conference constituency and it's in the hands of a local conference committee. Pastor Wilson, you may want to comment on that point. Uh, it is true. Uh, local church pastors are hired by local conferences. That's why we have to work through the system of the church, the structure, to help administrators uh, as they focus on how to resolve some of these situations. And I think one of these days, some pastors will simply not have a position in the church if they do not align themselves with what the Bible says. But you know, you can't do that overnight. It takes a little time because we have such a complex working arrangement. But absolutely, I want you to be assured, the vast majority of our church pastors are preaching wonderful messages from scripture. And I wanna urge all of you who are listeners, members in the church, if you find that your pastor is only speaking philosophical, uh, interesting anecdotes and stories, but never getting down to the Bible, uh, urge that pastor, please, pastor, we want to hear sermons from the Bible, because those are the life-changing things that can really help us in a practical way. Uh, As you have listened, brothers and sisters, I ask a very simple question. Does that mean the GC has no authority over pastors? We are in the sisterhood of churches, yes. 
and the GC is in charge of the general conference, is in charge of the divisions which are part of the GC, and the divisions are in charge of the unions. The unions are in charge of the conference. The conference is in charge of the church. Ordination is recommended from the general conference. And the GC does not have power to hire and fire someone. Well, I don't know. Now they said, if the pastor is not preaching the right message, you can actually tell the pastor to change. Members now, they can tell their pastors to change the way how they do things. Yeah, it's possible, but huh? what if, if the pastor is not humble enough to listen? What if the pastor is the one like that one in Patomi Conference who has actually said to the church, you are all disfellowshipped? This thing is very complex, is it? But brothers and sisters, somebody has looked at it differently. And I want you to follow this comment. After somebody has listened to this comment, they decide to comment. Look, they listen to the question and answer. If you have not done that, please just uh, go and listen. It's, uh, the, the, you can go to Hope Leaves and then you can go to the question and answer session. Very interesting. So this person say, I feel that you were just passing the buck. When it comes to uh, dismissing pastors who are going contrary to what scripture teaches and our fundamental belief, somebody needs to hold these pastors and even our SDA church school and universities accountable for embracing the LGBT plus lifestyle. All I heard was seek, seeking platitudes and politicking double speak. I expect more from the general conference. So if we fail to deal with this problem, can we not address it at local level? Can we not address it at GC level? Is this the best that we can do? I'm sure, by God's grace, this problem, as uh, the GC president has said, will be resolved. And it is my prayer that it will be soon. But remember, gen ladies and gentlemen, we are living in the time of the end. Apostates will only get worse. Now it says, uh, if Ted Wilson and Mark Finley would have taken action when all these apostasies and abominable behaviors come into the church in the beginning, we would not have all of these problems in the SDA, in the GC SDA uh, churches. Stop criticizing the world sin and ignoring the open sin in GC SDA churches. We must love all people. We must not let all all people practice their personal sins in our churches and not take action is the job of the leadership to take the appropriate action based on Bible scripture. What do you think, my brothers and sisters? Is this the responsibility of the general conference or someone else? Who is supposed to take action? But now why have they taken long? But now let's look at another comment before we do the application. I love you, you both pastors, but this is exactly how you are going to respond when the Sunday law is passed. Ooh, yes, that's powerful. This, is, uh, this person is speaking in love. I appreciate your service, but this may be what you are going to respond when the National Sunday law is passed. It's not my responsibility. And then the person says, remember the Sabbath and marriage are twin institutions. The test is on marriage now, and the Sabbath test is coming very soon. God's people need to see a strong in love stand on this issue. Pastor Mark, thank you. Thank God for your recent sermon. Praise the Lord. I also thank God for the recent sermon. Very powerful. However, the question is, can we respond differently? LGBT is sin. It stops there. How do I deal with sinners? We put them in the baptismal class. And then we help them to renounce their sin by God's grace. If they can't, it stops there. They continue in the baptismal class. Safe haven for adulterers is the same safe haven for LGBT. Adultery, LGBT, stealing, 
it's all sin. But now listen to this one. It is good that you shared biblical truth about this issue. But the way you said you deal with the pastors and read leaders who oppose what Bible said is not true according to what Holy Scripture said. When you say the general conference can't involve in how conference resolve this, it's like you are trying to say you don't care of whatever conference do or should or you sh and you should. Also, how can you let the pastors already seem that they are not doing according to what Holy Scripture said, waiting for him to keep poisoning church for a while? It was, I think, in February, if my memory serves me right, when Pastor Gunjavik was clear that is LGBT. And until today, he's still leading in that church in Haynes Conference, and nothing seemed to have happened. And that poison is progressing. Now he's welcoming the LGBT who are married, as we covered last week. Brothers and sisters, this is very serious. We need this process to be shortened where we can deal with sin straight away. But it seems as if sin could be dealt with much better at the local conference. But now this one says, why are you acting like politicians instead of GC leaders? Dare to be a Daniel. These churches should be condemned. Speak for Christ. Sin is sin. Call it what it is. Get Christ like pastors. What a disappointment. You both are. Our children in the church are watching these outward sins. They are being influenced. You are responsible for their souls. Do something. Act. Oh, yes. <laughs> this was very interesting. Is It's very serious, but they are true. It's true. Is this politics? Is it really true that the GC cannot do anything quicker? Can they not write their letters quickly? Can they not make phone calls to deal with this? Are we saying it's very difficult to police the church? What is the responsibility of the GC? Brothers and sisters, that's okay. Now let's come home. What is my responsibility? If the GC will fail, or if the GC will be overwhelmed, what is my responsibility as a child of God? The Bible says in the book of Jude, verse 3, Beloved, when I give you all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Why should I contend for the faith? For there are certain men creeping our ways who were before of old ordained to this condemnation and godly men turning grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. These men, brothers and sisters, they are ungodly men. They have come in among us. They have crept in and way. And they are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And they deny the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. These people are among us. And my job is to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. The things which cannot be dealt by the general conference, we can deal with them at the local church. We can make a decision at the local church. After all, we are in the sisterhood of churches and we are responsible for what is happening at our local church. We make a decision that we can't have an LGBT pastor. We can just safely say, Pastor, you are not going to work here. We are done with you. I've seen it happening in London. I've seen it happening all over the world. I've seen it happening in this country where I am right now. The members can safely say, Pastor, we are done with you. And they will just tell the conference, we can't have this pastor. We contend for the faith locally. We contend for the faith within our board. We contend for the faith within our business meeting. 
is the church locally. After all, the church is where two or three are gathered. Content for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. But there are people who are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. The question is what exactly is lasciviousness and what is it associated? As I was studying, I've realized that lasciviousness is associated with the Nicolaitans doctrine. Let me take you to the Bible commentary, page 957. Paragraph 6, he says, The doctrine is now largely taught that the gospel of Christ has made the law of God of no effect, that by believing we are released from the necessity of being doers of the word. But this is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, which Christ so unsparingly condemned. Now the question is, how did the Nicolaitans behave? Now, the Nicolaitans believed that they are free to commit adultery. They are free to eat things sacrificed to idols. They are free to worship idols. As long as be they believe in Christ, they have been freed from some of the commandments. This is where we are, brothers and sisters, where people, they believe that they can practice homosexuality and they should be accepted in church. And in church today, we have taken a stance where we have accepted the homosexuals. And some places, they have got positions. As we can see that pastors, homosexuals, they are allowed to continue to be on the payroll while those who commit adultery or while those who commit other other open sins they are censured in this fellowship brothers and sisters this is a very serious thing but we are in the doctrine of the Nicolaitans but now let me take you to the book of Revelation chapter 2 verse 6 the Bible says but this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now the question is, why did Jesus hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans? Let me take you to chapter 2, verse 15 of Revelation says, So as thou also them which hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So the people that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, they are in the church. What's important to the Nicolaitans is the heart, the action doesn't matter. What's important is their presence. In the church their behavior doesn't matter there are people who separate the soul and the body they believe that you can indulge with your body as long as you have a relationship with Jesus Christ everything is well now I like what Patrick John say he said who were the Nicolaitans Irenaeus a second century minister who grew up near Ephesus referred to them in one of his writings. The Nicolaitans claimed to be Christians. He said, but they considered it a matter of indifference to practice adultery and eating things sacrificed to idols. It appears then that the Nicolaitans were Christians who felt that faith in Jesus has released them from obedience to the Ten Commandments. First, in 1 first John chapter 2, verse 4, John wrote against similar people who were saying, I know Jesus Christ, but those people were breaking the commandments. So this is the kind of people that existed during the time of Ephesus and also the time of Pegamos. And these are the characters that we see in the church today. They say they know Christ, but they deny the commandment. They say they know Christ, but they refuse the power that sanctified them. In other words, they profess to know Jesus by the word of mouth, but they deny the power thereof. These are the people which Paul say, from such turn away. These are the people that, that we exist in the time of the end. But now look at this other comment. This is from the periodicals. February 18, 1897 says, Those who are teaching this doctrine today have much to say in regard to faith and the righteousness of Christ, but they pervert the truth and make it save the cause of error. They declare that we have only to believe on Jesus Christ and that faith in all is all sufficient, that the righteousness of Christ is to be the sinner's credentials. That is imputed righteousness fulfill, fulfills the law for us and what we are and that we are under no obligation to obey the law of God. In other words, uh, they don't want the experience of Christ. They believe that what Jesus did is enough. They don't believe in the sanctifying power. 
But brothers and sisters, remember Christ will save us from sin. Christ will not save us in sin. Nicolaitans believe that we can continue in our sin. But brothers and sisters, we are called to repentance. We are called to transformation. We are called to change. I want to take you to the review in Herald, June 7, 1897. It says, it is our work to know our special failings and sins, which cause darkness and spiritual feebleness and quench our first love. It is my job to know my problem. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me and see if there be any evil in me. This is a call to everyone. When I know my problem, and then he say, is it worldliness? Is my problem worldliness? Is my problem selfishness? Is my problem love of self-esteem? Is it striving to be faced? Is it the sin of sensuality that is intensely active? Is it the sin of the Nicolaitans turning the grace of God into lasciviousness? Is it the misuse and abuse of the great light and opportunities and privilege make boasted, making boasted claims to wisdom and religious knowledge while the life and character are inconsistent and immoral? What exactly is my problem? When I have discovered my problem, I go to God. He helps me to overcome my problem. Is it LGBT, homosexuality, gayism? Is it the problem? Do I feel for other men? Do I feel for other women while I'm a woman? Sin is in me, but God can give me power to overcome this sin. I will not be saved in my sin. I need to forsake my sin by the power of God. When sin has been revealed to me, I'm called to repentance. When the church has got members of the LGBT, the job of the church is to bring Christ to them. Christ and him crucified. You know, as I went through the comments on the message which was preached by Pastor Finley, I realized there are people who give a testimonies there. I was once a member of LGBT. God set me free. As I listened to Pastor Finley give me some comments, he said, I've discussed with so many people, and the psychologists say, most of those who say they've got uh, this certain gender when they are young, when they are old, they will revert to their real gender. Brothers and sisters, God is calling us to repentance. And God wants us to lift up Jesus Christ who can bring repentance, change, and transformation to our brothers and sisters trapped in sin. CTBH, Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 131 says, If lasciviousness, vice, and crime are the order of the day among those who refuse to be controlled by the principles of God's word, how important that those professing to be followers of Christ closely, closely allied to God and angels should show them a better and nobler way. How important that by their chaste conduct they should stand in marked contrast to the class who are controlled by best passion. Yes, those who are controlled by appetites and passion. Those who are controlled by best passion, it is my responsibility, it is your responsibility to point them to Jesus Christ, to live a life different to them, to help them to understand where they are fallen. We are to stand apart from the works of darkness, brothers and sisters. Lasciviousness has no part. Lasciviousness is associated with all kinds of evil. When the Bible talks of lasciviousness, is in the category with all kinds of evil. Now let's go to Mark chapter 7, verse 21. The Bible says, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceedeth evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murderers, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, evil, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, 
all these evil things come from within and defile the man. This is what uh, Mark is saying. Lasciviousness is associated with adultery, it's associated with envy, it's associated with the hatred, it's associated with everything. Lasciviousness is the last lust of the flesh, and the works of the flesh are reflected in the book of Galatians from chapter 5 from verse 16. It says, This I say then. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust of for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Brothers and sisters, the call is that we may be led by the Spirit. Now listen to the next verse. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the, the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And before we knew Christ, we were once in that fashion, but we were once living that lifestyle. But God has transformed us, he has called us into the commonwealth of his people, he has given us a new heart. He has given us a new life. Therefore, brothers and sisters, it is a call of God that we may live a life of sin. It is a call of God that we may lead by example. It is a call of God that we may call things by their rightful name. It is a call of God that we may contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It is a call of God. He is counting you and me to contend for the faith because among us, there are those who are contending for sin, but by the grace of God, we can stand like a breath with our face to the fore. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for the time that you have given us. In the struggle with sin, as your children, by the grace of Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, we will overcome. Give us grace, O oh Lord, to overcome this trouble. Give us grace, O oh Lord, to overcome all kinds of sins. By thy grace and thy power, help us as your church. Help us as your children. Blessed be your name in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord truly bless you. I look forward to see you in the fifth edition as we progress with the subject of contenting for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Don't forget to share the message. Don't forget to subscribe to the Herald Report YouTube ministry. And don't forget to leave a comment. Don't forget to ask your questions. Until then, may you continue to be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.